Let us have a look at how we can do this uh, running of the jellyfish and some R coding here. So uh, this is from module 3, section 251. Copy the code above into a shell script, save it in module 3 folder on your home, maneuver into this folder, module 3 folder and espatch to slurm. That's the first thing we need to do. So, in order to do this, I have logged on to Orion with our studio. I also have my terminal window here. We always have both these, both terminal window and our studio. So, <clears throat> the first thing I should do was to make a new folder, and then I, I can actually do it here in my terminal. It should be called module 3, making a new folder like this. And there it is, and then I step down to this, module 3, yes, use the tab button to extend your typing. And inside here, there should be nothing, right? And out here, if I refresh my file, I will also see the new folder here, so I click down into here, and I always like to have it as a working directory. Set it as working directory like this. So the next thing we are going to do is to copy that code. Let me go back to that. Copy the code above. Then we have to scroll up here. And this is the shell script, the code. So let me just copy the whole thing here, down here. Copy. And then I <coughs> maneuver to R Studio because this is where we do all our typing, right? Typing our scripts. New file, and now I want a text file because this is a shell script. So I don't want to make an R script. I make like this, and here I just paste in everything. And now I should save this immediately. And what should I call it? <clears throat> well, you can call it whatever you like. I like to use names like this, jellyfish and .sh for shell. And make sure you save it now in that module 3 folder. Look at the path here. Look at the path. Don't just assume it's correct. Always check this. And then save and it should pop up here and some nice coloring of the code as well. So <clears throat> I will not go through the code here because that's uh, something you can read. And uh, I only noticed we have reserved 10 tasks, 10 gigabytes of memory. We have a, <clears throat> a name on the job. And we load the jellyfish module from Orion. We use the 10 threads. Yeah, this number should always correspond to this number here, right? These two must always be the same. And here are the files we're going to to, to count. These are the files. Yes, the uh, FASQ files. We are going to count canonical k mirrors, right? And uh, the output is first in this file here, because you need to first produce this file in order to, to produce the real out file here. And notice uh, these files, as it is specified here now, they will uh, end up in the same folder as the shell script, because there is no path in front of them. Right? So this will end up in this same folder. When you don't specify a folder, you will get the folder where you start the shell script, and that's where the shell script is saved. And then th this is a special part of, of this particular shell script. And this is only needed because this silly jellyfish software cannot read the compressed files. You can see these files are compressed due to this uh, ending here, file extension here. And this uh, jellyfish software cannot read compressed files. Almost all other softwares can do that. So this is particular for this 
this special software. We need to copy the copy the files to the scratch disk. Then, so this is where we copy the two files. We change the name of the R1, R2 uh, files to only the base name, so we forget about the original path. Right? We take away the original path. Then we decompress the files. And then we uh, put new names on these uh, files. Yeah. So let's see if this works. And then we do the jellyfish count. And there's a number of, uh, of uh, options here. And after jellyfish count, we use the jellyfish histo. Notice that uh, this first statement here produces the count file. This one. Right? The counts.jf is, is produced by the first uh, soft, uh, command here. And then we use that as input to the second command here, so the second uh, statement here. And then we produce the final alpha. This is the one we are interested in, right? And these are these error-free reads. So that's why we have this name, error-free on the output file. And then we do some cleaning up in the end. We just delete some files here. So let's see if this works. Uh, yeah, the file is saved and we need to sbatch it from the terminal window. sbatch and then the name of the file. And then I type just shell and then use my tab button and verifies that this file actually exists in this in this folder right it's batch like this and if you have uh, used my looked at my previous video you will see how i made this alias sq to look into the queue in a nicer way so here we can see the first one here is the r, r studio session running and the second one was the R jellyfish that started now. So it's running now for 14 seconds and I can just repeat by up arrow. Now it's done. Let's go over here and see if we have, yeah. So here we see now the output file uh, uh, appeared and also there's a log file. And this one comes from the statement, if you scroll to the top, out up here, right? So we want the log file, the output here, to be in the file called jellyfish, and then the job idea, dot log. And that's exactly what we got, jellyfish underscore the job ID number, dot log, yeah. So this file is no longer really uh, needed. I delete it, and it's also empty, you can see. This, this is where error messages end up typically. And many software will have some output, so the log files could very well be interesting to look into. But this, in this particular case, it's not. So I just delete it. So this was the file we were going to look at. And we can see it's 5.3 kilobytes. So it's uh, everything under five megabytes. We can just open in RStudio. I can just click it open like this. And we can see it, it is only two columns of, of numbers, this. Two columns of numbers. And now we should try to read this in. Wasn't, wasn't that the next part of this sort of exercise? Yeah. It should produce a text file like this, yes, in your module three folder. It's, it has two columns separated by a blank. The first column lists the frequencies, the counts observed when counting k-mers. Okay, so if I, let me click it open again. Okay, so these, the, these are the counts, right? One, two, three, yeah, that sounds reasonable. And the second column, <coughs> the second is the frequency of frequencies. So it means that <coughs> Uh, we count the k-mares, right? And some k-mares are seen one time, some are seen two times, some are seen three times, and so on, and so on, and so on. 
And how many K-mers were seen once? That's this second number here, 16 K-mers. 16 different K-mers, right? We saw one time. 53 different K-mers were seen two times. 32 different K-mers were seen three times, and so on and so on. So we should uh, uh, read this into R, right? And make a plot, wasn't that? Uh, yeah, make an R script to read this and make a bar plot of the second column versus the first uses the geom call. Okay, let's see if we can do that. Then we need an R script, whoops, R script. And then I will start by loading the tidyverse packages because I know that reading a table that's typically the read the lim function. Reading a, a, a separate a, a text file like this, which is sort of has columns. So the file that I'm going to read is, I need the file name first, count, and then I do exactly the same thing as in the terminal window. I start typing and then I press the tab button. And you can see RStudio filled in the rest of the name because there is exactly one file named with these first four letters in this folder that I'm working in. If, if this was not possible, if, if it couldn't extend this file name, it means that the file is not in the folder you are working in. It's not in your working directory. So this was the name of the file. We also need to specify the delimiter. And notice this was not a tab, but it was a blank. Separated by a blank, it says. And we also saw it when we looked at the file. This is not a tab. This is a single blank between the columns. So the, the limb is just a single blank, like this. We also see there are no column names here, right? We we could add some column names uh, and we should at least say either call names is either false meaning that we turn off col column names altogether or we should give some column names uh, because otherwise the first two the first row will be used as column names by this read the limb function and I call this, uh, yeah, just a name. It's, it's, it will become a table, right? So let me save this file now and try to run it. Save as, and again, notice it's in this folder, yes. <coughs> yeah, some name, jelly count. And this should be .r, right? And it should pop up here. Let's run this step by step. First, we load the tidyverse packages. This always creates some output. And then we try to read. And here we read it in now. 799 rows of two columns. If we click it open in here. Yeah, now we can see it, didn't, it, it, it doesn't get proper column names, just x1, x2, because we turned it off. We can always, uh, if it's usually a good idea to have good column names. I make a new line here. Instead of just turning off, I can just add my own column names. And then I would call them, uh, what should I call them? Count and count count. Yeah, that's silly names. But anyway, with, the, uh, with this read the limb, you can either say column names equals false, turn them off, or give your own column names. Otherwise it will use the use the two first, I mean the first row as column names, which is in this case not a good idea. Okay, <clears throat> then we were going to plot. And ggplot takes as input a table, and this is exactly a table, so we can we can plot like this. And it said we should use this geom call to make a bar plot. Yes, geom call. 
And then, of course, you need to know how to use this geom. And if you don't know, you can either Google or, as always, question mark and the name of the function here in R, and you will get the help text for using this. So we need to specify a mapping first. And this one sh only uh, needs to know what's to, uh, what should we have along the x-axis, and that should be the count, the first column, right? Or we could type x1 now if we stick to the to the old solution here of not having a column name. Then the first column is x1. Uh, along the y-axis, we want the count count. The second, the second one. Uh, yeah, I think this is fine. Let's try this, and then we need to print the figure. So let's just run this and see how how it turns out. Yeah, it doesn't look very pretty. It's look it looks like a sort of a, a nail <laughs> here. And why is this? <laughs> Well, it's because we have obviously some very large counts along the x-axis, but most of the, in most cases, they are small, but some of them are huge. Right? Uh, so I think that in order to, to make this a little bit prettier, we need to either scale the x-axis or filter the data so that we don't have these big x values here, the big count values in there. Let me try to scale first, because that's the first thing I would try to do. Scale uh, x-axis by log. I think it's called log 10, actually, isn't it? Let's uh, plot it again with this. Now, this was not a very good uh, idea. It didn't look very good to me. Right? Again, it's just like a a nail in there. So I think that what I would like to do now is to just filter out some big values. Filter count should be less than, well, if we go back to the previous plot, use this back arrow here, we can see that a thousand, we can be well below 1000, well below 500, we can go even down to 250. Let's try that. 250, like this. Then we need to do the reading again. And then uh, our, we should take out this scaling again, because that was not a very successful thing. Like this. And now it starts to look better, because we can see there is one major peak here. And then there's some tiny little bars out here. And, and the remaining bars are super, it's probably only one observation, right? Of these super big count values. I think we could even go for, we can go down to 150, I would say. So we read the table and filter it so that we don't have all these very big values. Now it starts to look better. This looks better. So what do we actually see here? Uh, we see that when we count these canonical k-mers, most of them appear around like 60, 60 times, something like that, uh, with some rather smooth uh, shape of this distribution. And this looks pretty much like the Poisson distribution, doesn't it? Except we also have something out here. There are some k-mers uh, that we see approximately twice as often. Can you see that? These k-mers we see around 60 times. These are around 120 times. And this must be because of a rep, uh, repeated region. Remember, this is from a, a genome. The reads are error-free, but the reads are from a real genome. So the k-mers that comes from a region which is repeated once, I mean, there's two copies of this region, 
then of course those k-mers will tend to be counted twice as often as all the other k-mers who are only coming from regions that occur once. So that's why we have this slightly out here, I guess. I don't know, but I guess this. This is, the, this is quite typical, that you have the major peak and then you have a, a minor peak at twice that. And, and there could even be a third one even smaller at three times, right? And four times if you have regions repeated many times, right? But this is, uh, this is uh, how it looks like now. So, uh, the next, uh, yeah, and, and, and what is the K-mer coverage? That's the peak, right? The K-mer coverage is actually here, right? So it's around 60 something, I would say. So the, 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 the most frequently seen count is around 60, right? That should be the K-mer coverage. Yeah, and, and, and then you can compute the read coverage because we know the length of the reads. And then you can use this formula that we saw earlier here for, yeah, this formula here. And now we put in a value for dk and solve for d, right? Just, uh, we have all these values. We know the read length, we know the k-mer size, that's 21 in our case. So you can easily compute the d now once you have a value for dk. So put in 60 or something for dk and and this can easily be computed. But I was uh, going to look at this instead because here we have some other data. These are real sequencing data. These are not the error-free reads. These are real reads. So now we should run the yellow, uh, jellyfish script again. Let me just save this and go back to my jellyfish script. And the only thing I need to replace now is this R1, R2, right? So I go into the script like this. And here I have a new R1 file. I comment out the old one. And I also do the same for the R2 file. R2 equals like this and comment out the old one. And the rest is, no, I need to change one more thing, this alt file, because now I want to change the name of this one so I don't overwrite the one I already produced. I have this one, right, for error-free. And since this is no longer error-free, I just choose to call it like this. Now this is, <clears throat> Make sure you at least give it a different name so you don't overwrite the existing one. We want to keep the, this one and now get a new one. <clears throat> and this is really all that is needed. So we just save. Yeah, okay, I already saved it. I do that automatically <laughs> almost. Uh, we saved it and then we go back and dispatch again. So now I just use my up arrow to repeat. There we have, and I dispatch again. I can always have a look at, yeah, there it is. It's still, it's running. Have been for three seconds. Still running, 11 seconds now. It doesn't take very long time. Should soon be done. So I can always also up, up, uh, update this one. We can see a new log file has appeared, but no new result file, and there at least we see the counts file. So now we know the first part of the the first command is done. And there we have the final file. And now the count file is deleted again, because at the very bottom here, we, we put in a statement for removing it. So it will only be there for some very short time. So here we have the, the other file, right? And now we can go back to our R script and do uh, the same again for, um, then I just copy this and I say, now I want to read this file instead, but I do exactly the same thing. I also filter at 150. Could be that we should change that threshold now, but let's try first and see. Uh, I think I will also call this one figure one and this here figure two, right? 
So if I go back to my plotting window, I delete everything, all plots, and then I run this from scratch. And now I just source it, right? Source. And now we can see that, uh, yeah, this is how the, it looked like when we had the error-free reads, right? No sequencing errors. We had a read coverage up here. If we look at the second plot now, now we're back to this nail again, but we can also see there is something here. So now I would like to actually make this scaling, I think, again. Let me try, but this time the y-axis, right? Because now we, we want to make this peak here uh, not dominating the y-axis totally. So let me try that. I'm not sure it's a good idea, but let I always try this scaling the first thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. This is how it looks like now. This is how it was without scaling, and this is the logarithmic scan. So now you can see the logarithmic axis here. So here we have 10 counts, right? And here we have 1,000. <laughs> And here we have 100,000, and here we have 10 millions. And notice that if we go back to the error-free, here we have all the KMERs are around KMER coverage, right? Observed more or less around the KMER coverage. There is, of course, a variance here, but uh, all of them are sort of centered around this KMER coverage value, except for those particular ones out very few. But now we see a very different picture. Again, we see sort of a peak here around the KMR coverage. It's a little bit less though, right? Can you see that? It's, it's, it's a little bit less. But the big difference are these ones down here, occurring once or twice, right? And this is very typical due to sequencing error. This is due to sequencing error. And and, and, uh, and we can, uh, uh, it, it's tempting to say that everything below here, below that sort of valley here, is due to sequencing error. These KMERs occur very infrequently. We only see them, this one we only see once and never again, right? This one we see two times, this one's three times. And there are lots of them, right? Millions. So, uh, um, so these KMERs come from errors with reads, uh, 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 reads with errors, <laughs> reads with errors, right? And in the error-free case, there were no such KMERs. They didn't exist. They pop up when, st when we start to introduce sequencing error. Okay, so now <clears throat> you can also do the same in the, later in this uh, here, and later if I scroll uh, down, we should run this base hammer software on this data, on this data. And this base hammer software also produces some corrected reads, right? Okay, here, run jellyfish on base hammer output. So here is the, the script to run it. And then, uh, what you need to do here in order to plot those results, right, is, is to, uh, yeah, you can see here that in, in this case, I replaced the input data now, instead of using either the error-free or the original, I used the base hammer corrected data, right? And you, of course, have to replace my username with your, because this is my scratch disk when I'm logged in as myself you need to replace this username with your username to, to, to read from your results, right? And then, of course, I also changed the name of this uh, resulting file. <clears throat> and then you go back here and just do exactly the same thing again here, but read this base hammer file, of course. I don't have that now because I haven't run that script, but you can see this is exactly, and then you have figure three here. And then you can compare those results to the ones you see here now, because it should actually 
remove some of this here very low frequency these, these peaks should be smaller but they are not eliminated they are not eliminated by base hammer base hammer is a very sort of soft error correction and filtering uh, there are other other tools that will eliminate these entirely but then you lose a lot of reads so it's always a question if if this is a good idea so the base hammer will try to at least reduce them but not eliminate them entirely okay <laughs>